Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Doyle. I'm the director of Carbu. A very warm welcome to you all. And uh, I hope you are all well. No doubt we will be joined by others. But in the meantime, if you could be very kind and uh, keep yourselves on mute so that uh, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, upset the recording, doesn't upset our conversation today. Anyhow, we are really, really pleased today to have uh, a, a really wonderful virtual launch of the film Ayuni. It's an opp opportunity uh, to listen to Norrazi uh, Safadi, who is a Syrian human rights uh, activist, lawyer, as well as the uh, film's director, Yasmin Fedda. Now, you would have all seen all the uh, details on the bio, uh, perhaps even uh, the trailer, but we're going to uh, let you have a little uh, sense of that in a moment to give you a taster of the film. And it obviously deals with a, an issue that we're very, very uh, aware of, very tragic and difficult issue of the over 100,000 people, maybe more, who have been disappeared, disappeared within Syria over the course of the last nine years. It is a human tragedy on an epic scale. And I think this film, you know, does something absolutely wonderful to bring that to life through following two specific uh, stories. But I'm not going to talk to you all about that. It's an on-the-record meeting. It'll be recorded. We're going to start off with Yasmin Fedder, who will introduce uh, uh, the, the trailer. Yasmin is an award-winning uh, filmmaker. She's made all sorts of programs, as you can see from her bio, everything from uh, Edinburgh bakeries to Syrian monasteries, as well, of course, Ayuni uh, as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Yasmin, who will start by introducing the film and the project itself. Yasmin. Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you so much to Kabu for organizing this session. And thank you. To, it's so great to see so many of you and still more joining in. Um, it's really great to be able to share the film with all of you. I'm going to actually just start off by giving you a little story, a journey about how I got into this film and um, how I started making something about forcible disappearance. It's interesting when you actually start making a film, you never really know where a project will take you. And when I started this one, I thought it would, I didn't realize it would become to be a film about love and forcible disappearance. I started making a film in 2013 about an Italian priest, Father, Dal Father Paolo Dall'Olio. He'd lived in Syria for over 30 years and set up a well-known monastery. This focused on interfaith dialogue. When the revolution and uprising began, he became publicly outspoken and very involved. This led to his expulsion from the country, but this actually catalyzed him to become even more active. He met with so many people from civil society groups, diplomats, and village councils in Syria. Taking his belief in dialogue to new levels, he even set up a TV chat show to discuss difficult topics facing Syrians at the time, from questions of arms to sectarianism and to the role of journalism in the media. I had made some films with this community in the past, but these new developments of him as a person specifically fascinated me. I felt it offered a really unique perspective on what was happening in Syria. As a filmmaker, I wanted to get stuck in there with him and to explore through his eyes and his approach. We met and filmed in 2013 in Paris when he was prom promoting his new book titled A Priest in the Syrian Revolution. I didn't think this would be the last time that I saw him. A few months later, he was in Raqqa, there to negotiate the release of kidnapped journalists who were kidnapped by Daesh. At the time, Raqqa was liberated from regime forces, but in a very delicate moment. Daesh had a presence, but they still didn't have total control of the city. There was still a public civil society movement there. Paolo went to the meeting, and he's never been heard from since. There have only been rumors about his fate over the years. A few months later, um, sorry, there were rumors that he was killed, that he was alive, that he's been exchanged as a prisoner. There have been so many stories that it was unclear what had actually happened to him. Like many others, I didn't know how to react at first. I was shocked, I was angry, I was sad, and I had many questions about what was safe and right to do at the time. Paolo was a larger than life character, and he touched many people's lives across Syria and also across the world. The Paolo shaped absence that resulted was profound and resonated all over the place. 
I met his sister, Mackie, who let me film her over the years as she grappled with this reality of living in an emotional limbo, not knowing whether she should grieve or hope for her brother's return. In trying to understand this reality, um, I went to many countries to search of not exactly answers maybe, but to understand what a forcible disappearance is and what it does. I met more and more people whose loved ones were forcibly disappeared, the, mass majority, the vast majority by Syrian government forces. I began to understand how this was being used as a targeted weapon of war, a way to silence individuals and to put pressure on their families. It's a cruel tactic that numbs whole families and networks of people. And today, as Chris mentioned, there are more than 100,000 that are forcibly disappeared, and this violates international law. As a filmmaker, I wanted to find a way to give an expression to the effects of this war crime through individual, human, and emotional ways. I kept asking myself through all the years, it took about six years of filming, um, how do you make sense of what it means that someone is forcibly disappeared? What does this very present absence mean? How does it feel? What does it feel like to not know, to find huge barriers in your search for answers? What is the effect of so many voices being silenced? And what does this all mean for the future of Syria? How can it eventually rebuild when so many lives are disappeared and questions are unanswered? How will justice and accountability be found? And finally, as a filmmaker, how do I make a film asking all of these questions? Although this all made me sad and angry, I was determined to find a way to make it relatable to find a way to make a film that shows these universal human stories. This search led me to reconnect with the story of Basil Safadi Khartoubir, a well-known hacker and open source developer. He'd worked with Mozilla and Firefox and set up Creative Commons in Syria. From 2011, he supported so many people. He taught them how to film and to document what was happening around them and how to share it with news networks. He also supported people in getting footage out of Dara, which was in, under siege at the time. This was in 2011. He was imprisoned in 2012, but his network of friends had kept his story and voice alive through the Free Basel campaign for several years. At his arrest, he was initially disappeared, but he was finally moved to Adra civilian prison, where his wife, human rights lawyer Noura Ghazi, who's with us today, could visit him. I really wish I could have included more of this amazing story of love and detention in the film, but sadly I couldn't. But it was very moving to hear about how they kept their relationship alive through this time. In 2015, Basil was taken from his cell and forcibly disappeared. I met Nora first time after this, and she opened up her life to me as she was dealing with this very difficult phase in her life. Nora shared with me the effects of detention on detainees and on forced disappearance, as both of these had happened to Basil, and she had also been dealing with those as well. Her tireless work campaigning and on advocacy for detainees and those forcibly disappeared is inspiring. She was one of the founders of the Syrian women-led movement Families for Freedom and of No Photo Zone, which support detainees and the families of forcibly disappeared people through legal awareness and advocacy and other forms of support. As I worked on this film, I realized I had a unique opportunity because I had my own material that I had filmed with Paolo in the past and access to Basel and Noor's archives. This was material that either they had filmed or their friends had filmed. And this allowed me to tell all of these stories as much as possible in the people's own voices and in the present tense. Filming with Nora opened up a door for me that led me to understand that this film was also about love between a young couple and that between siblings. It's a film that's, a, it's a film that's inspired by the legacies of Paolo and Basil, who in their very different ways supported discussion, openness and sharing. And the film is driven by Maki and Nora's stories of resilience, hope, and search for accountability. It was this, through the years, that gave me hope for the future. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to share the trailer of the film. It's about two minutes long. Um, and then after this, uh, Nora would like to say a few words as well before we open up for a discussion. So just give me one moment while I line this up. And I understand you got married while he was still in prison, is that right? Yes, yep. we got married, uh, we made the marriage contract on uh, January 7th. 
2013, yep. and they call us uh, the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution. There are at least five people of our network who are killed. What do you think about your own safety? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay. You upload all this material, you get it out to the world. <laughs> آخر موقف موقف ضدنا أبونا باولو السيدين أبونا باولو شخص يعني دكتور Personalmente, quando ci vedo io, non ho nessuno che ci rischia della speranza. I didn't see the body, I didn't see the document, I didn't see anything, any evidence. Do you think you ever will? I have to. I will keep going on to have his body and all the information about his death, uh, the way, the date, all the things. I have to, all the people, all the Syrians have to, this is a humanitarian right. So I have to face this disaster. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to Noura Ghazi Safadi, who is also joining us on this call and uh, is going to say a few words. Thanks, Noura. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Chris. And thanks to all the participants. Um, actually, um, I will not talk about the, the film itself, as Yasmin has already talked about. I, I will talk about myself, Basel, the detention and enforced disappearance. In, in Syria. So let me start with my childhood. As I was five years old when my, when my father disappeared suddenly after somebody knocked at our door. My father was wanted because of his political, uh, oppositional political uh, activism uh, against the government in Syria. It was at uh, 1986. I left like six years without knowing anything about my father, except like some visits to him in Lebanon. Then my father disappeared again for almost one year and three months to know after this that he was detained and he was transferred to the central prison in Damascus, which called Adra prison. And he was, uh, he was referred to the Supreme uh, Security State court and this is exactly what made me a human rights lawyer as one of these sessions in this court i i just came to kiss my my dad so one of the policemen like pushed me and we had a fight then and i was 12 years old so i decided to be a human rights lawyer to defend all the prisoners of conscience in syria and maybe in the world years passed and i spent I didn't know actually that I will spend 22 years in my life visiting this prison. The revolution came and I was from the people who, who, who participate in this revolution since the beginning of it. I met Basel in a home in Duma, Eastern Ghouta. We were like we were headed at the same place in uh, uh, the place of our friends. I heard his voice. Uh, first, without seeing him, he was speaking English with with some media uh, agency, and he was talking about people who were detained and injured by the shooting at this demonstration. Then I saw him at the first time. For many hours, I thought that that he's not Syrian or Palestinian or from the Arab world. Then I discovered that he is Palestinian Syrian. Few days later, we became 
um, close friends and we were doing our civil activism together. We were going to the demonstration. We were doing a kind of human rights documentation for all the population in, in Syria at this period. Like less than two months, we felt in love. And after less than one month, we decided to get married. We got engaged and then we, we were preparing for our marriage, although we were, both of us were wanted by the Syrian authorities. But despite all of this, we just want, wanted to see ourselves as, as a bride and the groom. Two weeks before our wedding party, Basil disappeared again. So uh, it needs me like a few hours to know that Basil was arrested. Uh, it was so hard to explain uh, how I felt because at, at this time I was just feel that I'm a woman who is preparing for her wedding party, waiting her wedding dress. Um, I forget everything about what is happening and the, the danger that we are in the middle of it. Almost 10 months passed and Basil appeared again. I received a message, a letter from him, a written letter, says that uh, he was in another prison, but he was referred to the military field court and he is not allowed to have visits. Before this, like many months be before this, uh, we launched Free Basil campaign, which we have um, like the leader of this campaign, Dana Trometer here. And I, because of this campaign and because of Basel detention, I could have friends from like across the world maybe. And this is so actually amazing for, for me. And uh, those people who like a lot of them do not do, uh, do not know each other. So those people become close friends and we were day and night so close to each other to raise awareness, not only about Basel case, but Basel case was almost a symbol about the detention in Syria the, the disappearance in Syria, torture, ill treatment, all these all this, uh, issues that related to detention and basically dictatorship in, in Syria. Then I could visit Basel after he stayed for almost 25 days in Sednaya Jail. And because of this great campaign that touched everyone in this world, we could, uh, we could be succeeded to uh, to transfer Basel again to another prison and allow him to be visited. I started visiting him and we got married at the beginning in 2013 to be named as the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution. And I'm so happy and honored to have this name. Almost three years passed and I was almost the main person who is reaching out the international organization and all the government who are involved and in charge with this about what happened in detention centers. Um, I visited more than 400 male prisoners during the, uh, the stay of Basel in, in Adra prison. I got all these testimonies from people uh, that transferred from Sednaya jail and from many uh, security facilities. So through the campaign of Basel and through my visits, uh, to, to Adra prison, I could uh, raise awareness about military field court, about Sednaya jail, and about all this in Syria. I met Basel last time at my birthday in September 30, 2015. Three days later, Basel called me from the prison and told me that they, they, come, they came to take him, but he, don't know, he doesn't know who's or, or to where. Excuse me that I'm I'm always talking about Basel in the present, not the past. It's not a grammatical uh, fault. Um, I had a bad feeling, uh, despite of that, the administration of the prison was promising me that Basel will get released so soon. As usual, I just called Dana and told her what happened. I spent almost two years sometimes trying to, to search the, the fate of Basel and sometimes I was just escaping to know the truth because I had this bad feeling. Then I decided and I went to the normal uh, ways in Syria. So we, we, know, we knew people from the military police and military court. And then the Russian embassy in Syria confirmed that Basel was sentenced to death. 
few days after he was taken from Madra prison. Um, now I cannot like describe what happened to me, but I was okay because almost okay because I had these great people around me. I was under the attention of the international organizations of all the government and the media. And because that I work in this field, it was hard and easy at the same time because I always and still feel that people need me. So a few months later, I had to leave Syria for security reasons. So I left Syria to Lebanon at, um, at 2018, early 2018. And after the help and support of Dana, I could have a fellowship in uh, a scholarship to have a master's in, in UK. And when I came to Lebanon, I, I saw that these women and families of missing persons and detainees that need a help. So I apologized and I quit the scholarship and I stayed in Lebanon and established No Photo Zone organization that provides legal assistance, legal empowerment and advocacy for all the detainees, their families and the families of enforced disappeared and missing persons. With my great team, we could reach more than 400 families in Lebanon, in Bika and Tripoli. And we could raise awareness about all the issues related to detention and enforced disappearance. We work as well in Syria. We are trying to to give our uh, services to every single person that uh, have this problem, even in the world. Our plans is to have a branch in Turkey and then a branch in Germany. Then actually I was, I became recognized by many international organizations and government as I was, I had a speech last, uh, last month at the UN Security Council talking about uh, these issues in, in Syria. What I aim to is to put all these women and families and detainees under the light as I was and my husband uh, under the light all the time. I was, let me say, a star in many movies. <laughs> and actually, I, I wanted to be an actress, but because of my promise to my dad, I studied law. And I'm happy that I studied law. But um, life is so strange that Life puts me in a place that I, I participated in many movies. But for this movie, I considered it that one of the most important movies that I was involved in. It's not because only the topic and the like professionality of the director and the producer and the film teams. It's always it's also because I'm like I, I was with the great people, like Father Paolo is an icon in Syria, Basil is an icon in Syria, and Maki, it was so pleasure to, to meet her. And um, also because uh, that many of the parts from Basil and Father Paolo were, were used in this movie. So I, I felt that I live in, the, in some way in the past. I'm, I'm staying with those people. They are not just vanished in some ways. We are all together in this field. I keep watching this film again and again all the time. Sometimes I cry, sometimes I feel so happy that I live up. I feel that I, I, I still live with Basel in some way. Because all of this and because all of the effort that Yasmin did, Yasmin became a very close friend to me and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to, have, to have her as, uh, as a friend and she she kept following me from country to country to film me and I know that she she was so tired and she was pregnant when I met her first and now uh, Zuzu is more than three years old so it's like it's really like strange life. Finally I want to conclude with talking about justice. Uh, after almost 10 years of conflict in Syria Sometimes we feel that we are so pessimistic to feel that justice will come so quickly. But what I always raise is to, to look at justice, justice from different uh, point of views. Like justice is not only accountability, with the importance of that accountability and these cases that applies in, uh, in Germany and all these uh, sessions of the court in, in Germany, according to the universal jurisdiction, 
but also let, let's help all these families across the world, like Syrian refugees, especially in neighboring countries, to get just small pieces of this justice, like recognition of the crimes against them and against their beloved ones, and also by reparation. I always invite everyone for forgiveness, actually. And sometimes I be like, um, like I had this look that what I'm talking about, but forgiveness will help the Syrian society to recover from all this. Reco uh, forgiveness do not uh, prevent any kind of recognition or accountability, but we have this like big sickness now among the Syrian society. In Nofoto Zone, we are provide our services from all the people from different political backgrounds, and we were successful to gather people from loyalists and opposition. At the end, I am st still looking for Basel remains and burial location, and I hope everyone helped me with this. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yasmin, and thank you, Nora. That was uh, extremely powerful, and you spoke with such, such dignity and uh, passion about, uh, I think, for us who haven't been in Syria during these times, who haven't had uh, loved ones disappeared. I think we're certainly, I can speak for myself and Nora of, of the way in which you've gone around campaigning about this. Uh, we're going to open it up to, to questions now. So if you'd like to put some questions in the chat, that would be fantastic and I shall call you out. But I suppose I just wanted to kick off a few questions, uh, uh, perhaps to, to, to you, uh, Yasmin, firstly. Uh, the film, importantly, uh, uh, where can people see it, etc.? Are you going to be able to, uh, do you have any plans post COVID or whether it might be shown or, or whatever? Or, or have you had reactions to it from, from within uh, the Arab world and elsewhere? Yeah, good questions. Um, I mean, currently you can access the film through the film's website, which is iunifilm.com. Um, we're also doing a few events with different partner organizations. So we're doing a screening and Q&A with Doc House next week. We're also doing a webinar actually on detention and disappearance in Syria with the Syria campaign next week. So if anyone's interested, we can maybe send the information about that. Um, so far, we've had a good reaction, um, but obviously we're slowly building up interest um, in, the, in the film. Um, and I really hope that one day we can do physical screenings. I think film, the power of film is really by gathering people together um, in a space to be able to share feelings, experiences, um, being together when they watch something. So this, it's definitely something we'd like to do. It's just difficult to be able to say when when and how that's going to look, but it's definitely on the forefront of our planning. Understandably, and Joe's circulated uh, helpfully in the chat, the URL for the, for the film. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Nora, if I could just turn to you. Um, you know, in all of this, I think you've uh, actually spoken to, to, to the Security Council, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, how have you found, you know, international, uh, political and diplomatic circles and reacting to this? Do you feel that you have had enough support, um, you know, in this? You've got a very powerful story in theory and many countries uh, nominally, you know, say that they want to see the Syrian regime and other parties in the conflict adhere to human rights. But how have you found this in reality? Yeah. Actually, regarding to the film, uh, there were a lot of uh, great reaction by like diplomats and politicians. Um, but regarding to the uh, issue of detention in, in Syria, we always see this like emotional reaction. And especially this like um, a kind of uh, uh, like getting attention and interesting with specific people as if those people are the only victims in, in Syria. So basically, uh, we can see, it's easy to see that we have like 20, 30, maybe 100, 100 of detainees and efforts disappeared that all the people are talking about all the time. But nobody is getting any attention to the other people. So it's unfair to talk about just some people and to, to provide like a lot of... Um, 
things to those uh, to their families and just uh, ignore the others and especially that those others uh, I mean these non well known people are more need to to those uh, services and um, I'm, I'm talking about this because I'm in a struggle now for a woman. She is a former detainee and she was detained with her baby and her family abandoned her after she got released and her, 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 her husband divorced her and she is living in Lebanon with, or with, with, with five kids without any kind of help and I'm trying to get her to Europe and I'm facing these difficulties and obstacles to get her to Europe, for example. So what we are seeing from the international community is just emotional. It's just like what's, what we say in the Arab world, just words on paper. There is nothing to be happened. We want a whole and comprehensive solution for this issue. And this will happen after an international political decision. And this decision needs to be a will for it. And until now, unfortunately, I cannot see any international will to solve everything in Syria. I fear you might be right in that. Uh, did you reach out at all? I mean, you mentioned at, at one point going to the Russian embassy, but you know, uh, what about Russian officials in, uh, at the United Nations, etc.? Do they give you any sense that uh, uh, they can help you and other people in this? I mean, uh, or do they just refuse to see you? Actually, first to clarify, I didn't ask the uh, Russian embassy in Syria to find out the fate of Basel some of my friends asked them without getting back to me and after they confirmed to me i started my relations with the russian embassy because i didn't be to be understand understood that i am asking russia to help because with respect to anyone the russia is involved in all the syrian crisis but after basel death i i went to russian embassy and i met many of diplomats and I asked them to, to have a kind of collaboration to find um, a fair solution for the detention and for disappearing issues. And I had a study then, I, I, I've sent them the, the study and we have many uh, talks and we negotiated a lot of uh, times about this and after this they reveal they help or they uh, like they push the government to reveal a fate of like thousands of detainees between 2018 and 2019 um all those detainees was uh, were dead uh, be in the detention centers but at least the families had the right to know and mm. uh, now i have no relation with russian after i left syria because the russian embassy in lebanon where i live is not involved in in Syrian issues, but I met many uh, Russian representatives in, like in Geneva, in the UN, and I, I always seek to have a meeting with Russia. They are now, it's a fact and reality, and we cannot ignore it, and we cannot uh, have like political uh, positions from anyone because we need to solve the problem, and Russia is almost controlling everything in Syria now. And you know, you obviously, in terms of your human rights work, doing a lot with detainees and uh, disappeared people. But the Syrian regime has now obviously reacquired uh, control over a lot more territory mm -hmm. now, which means that obviously there are lots of uh, Syrian opposition figures uh, who, who have been picked up. How do you see the current situation, particularly in these areas that the regime has taken again? Basically, I feel that the regime will get all the areas in Syria, like the, the whole Syria. And this is just like uh, a kind of, I don't know, it's apparently control all Syria, but it controls nothing, actually. And I just, I just like can say that we are just the people that look at their country, how it's destroyed and Many parties control it and we're just silent or we're just like speaking loudly, but for nothing. Uh, we just people know how to lose every day and we just lose. I'm staying here where, from, where my family, all my family uh, stay in Syria and they are threatened because my activism all the time. And so I, I just seeing, I'm just seeing my family under the threaten, 
I'm just seeing myself that cannot go back to Syria. I don't know, maybe in 10 years, maybe forever. I'm just seeing my country destroyed. And I don't know, um, usually I don't like talk so angrily about the Syrian regime, but I feel angry in my heart, but um, like he just destroyed us and himself, actually. I'm talking about the president right now. He just destroyed everything and himself as well, for nothing. I think it's very understandable, um, your reaction. Um, I'm gonna, we have a question from Bernie uh, Howley. Bernie, um, you've got a couple of questions. I think I've just unmuted myself, yeah? You have. <laughs> I've watched the film and I was really moved by it. I thought it was wonderful. Um, and I think you're both incredibly courageous women to have made this film and it's, it's very well done. But I've got two questions. Firstly, to Yasmin. Um, do you know um, what has happened f with Paolo, where his, his whereabouts, his fate? Has, is there any news since the film was finished? Is there any more news? Unfortunately not. Um, actually, July 29th this month will be the seven-year anniversary of his disappearance. Um, there's nothing. There's literally just been rumours every year. Um, there are sort of bursts of rumours every once in a while, maybe because something's happening, like last year with the sort of final battles with Daesh, there was a little burst of rumors like, oh, he's still alive, maybe he'll be exchanged, this kind of thing. But it, it's really hard to substantiate whether any of that is true. I mean, some people say, oh, but this source is really reliable, but it's been really hard to, to find anything out. Um, and it's also been really difficult for the family to find out. There hasn't actually been real support uh, for them to find out what's happening. And equally, the difficulty in the Daesh areas, there's a lot of information being lost um, or, or not being gathered. Um, and so that information for the thousands of Syrians who were disappeared there in those areas, so separate to the regime disappearances, that information itself is also being lost, um, any traces of information. So that's, yeah, that's the situation at the moment. It's really tough, really tough. Yeah, um, my second yeah. question was, to Nora, um, do you feel that the trials in Germany are going to do anything? I mean, I, I know that there's so much going on in the world with COVID and everything else, that everything seems to be kind of pushed to one side. But do you think that um, the trials in Germany are going to do anything to bring the eyes of the international community on all of the injustices and horrors and disappearances in Syria? Do you think it's going to have an effect? What's your feeling about that? By way of background, this is the, the trial in, in Berlin um, uh, before a German court of uh, a member of the uh, Syrian uh, secret police. And I think, is, is it a dozen witnesses uh, have come forward in terms of uh, uh, giving evidence in this? So, uh, yes, uh, uh, Nora, what do you think? Yeah, for sure. I'm so happy with these trials in, in Germany. Basically, uh, they are, I think all of them are in Koblenz. But uh, at the same time, I'm afraid that because of these trials, we have to think like more broadly about everything. I'm afraid that these trials will lead the Syrian regime to like to get rid of all the evidence against them or to kill all the witnesses. Uh, basically, after 2015, for example, we have no idea about what is happens of the bodies of the detainees, because after Caesar's photos and um, and then later after the uh, report of Amnesty International about Said Nayan Jail, um, we have many evidence that the Syrian regime are getting great of uh, of the bodies by burning them. So we have to like to think that it might be danger on all other people and it might prevent the other, like the officers in many uh, facilities and in the army maybe, uh, to be like uh, so hesitate to get to defect or something. So it has like many effects. Um, I hope it will be for like for the interest of all uh, and benefit for all the Syrians and for justice in the world. It's not only about Syria, basically the crisis in Syria affect many countries. Um, but yeah, I had this like uh, two feelings. 
Thank you. I understand your concern, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Bruce Stanley. Bruce. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm interested in whether outsiders have any influence or role in uh, Syrian prisons. So many prisons around the world, and particularly in the Middle East, are influenced by outside ideas, such as supermax prison ideas from the United States or the Chinese provision of surveillance technology. Uh, we know the Israelis play a role across the region as well. So particularly, I guess, for Russia and others, is there any sense that Syria interlinks its prison and prison management with other governments or other providers? I think the question is for me. I think so. I mean, unless Yasmin yeah. has something. Okay, I will start Yasmin. If you want to add, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, so um, actually, usually uh, I, I meet a lot of representatives of many governments like Americans, European, and others. Um, but uh, like what I feel from my experience on this uh, in this field that okay now uh, like Russia is the best tool to talk and negotiate with about and excuse me but we've been hearing promises from America and Europe for almost ten years with doing nothing on the field so it's um, like it deserves to have a try with Russia. Um, I'll just add, I actually don't know about the management of other countries and the prison systems, but something that Paolo is advocating for and might still be relevant, and maybe Nora could say something about this, is um, access to the prisons has been very limited. Like he used to make the example that even in the Second World War, the Red Cross could get access to prisons across Europe, and even in Syria, they're not able to get access to prisons in Syria to see the conditions of prisoners. Um, so besides the management, there's also other ways that maybe. Uh, international bodies or outside bodies could be involved in the prison system problem. Yeah, regarding the prisons, actually, the ICRC have access uh, to some prisons, but just the civil prisons, and this needs a permission from the, the Syrian government. And usually I met ICRC by co coincidence many times in the central prison in Damascus. So usually the administration of all the detention centers prepare everything before these visits. So uh, they uh, amplify all the, like, the rooms and sections in, in prison. Like for them, for example, we have a sections in Andhra prison that uh, like a specialist for 32 prisoners, but it held more than 100. So they amplify every, or most of the prisoners to have like different look about the reality. Um, I'm not sure if Russian have uh, access to prisons, but what I'm pretty sure about that the Russian are involved in solving some uh, some issues related to some detainees. For example, uh, lately in in Dera, uh, uh, they uh, they were the the reason to release like more than 50 uh, prisoners in in Dera, uh, like the. You know the the late demonstration in Sweda, south of Syria, that uh, there were more than ten uh, persons who were arrested. So uh, all of them were released, and this was happened by the efforts of of like let's say uh, it's like I have to mention honestly the uh, the team of the special envoy uh, Gear Peterson and especially his uh, his deputy Khawla Matar. I I meet Khawla Matar like uh, every few days and um, like always I'm I'm seeing her how she works. Uh, she works on the detainees issues and uh, I I was. Uh, I had a, a full idea about uh, what she did for the whole, for those uh, detainees from Sweden. So uh, everyone was released a few days ago and everything was, uh, was okay. And basically because of some like people from, from Sweden itself. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm seeing now is that they are playing, playing like a positive, uh, a positive uh, position with the detainees issues. Uh, at the same time, they are playing um, like a negative position or negative role in bombing and controlling areas. But uh, we need to deal with this fact. 
Thank you very much. It reminds me when you said about uh, the Syrian regime, you know, presenting this shiny image of prisons, a uh, feedback meeting of British MPs in the 1990s going to Iraq and said they'd seen one of Saddam's prison and there was nothing wrong with it, as if somehow that was a true and fair reflection of uh, uh, what it was like in uh, Saddam's prisons. Now we got a, a question from Penelope Quinton. Penelope, Penny, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I, I was just wondering, thank you. Um, I was wondering, is there any evidence that prisoners, disappeared people or prisoners are being transferred across national borders? So when people resurface again, do they know if they were moved beyond Syria? Um, who wants to yeah. answer? Yeah, um, Yasmin, do you want to answer? I think Nora go for it. Okay, we have no idea. We don't think that those detainees are like transferred out of Syria. Um, but uh, like, for example, in Lebanon, there are many detainees or prisoners actually. They are transferred to Syria from Lebanon. And I, I talked with ICRC about this because they need to be uh, protected even by the Lebanese government. So basically ICRC are responsible and they are they have regular visit to, to, uh, to the prisons in, in Lebanon. Um, we had like, I don't know, there is no evidence, but uh, I guess that uh, we had many examples that Turkey uh, transferred many prisoners to Syria, but from Syria to other place, I don't think so. Is there any evidence that Turkey has itself uh, picked up detainees from within Syria and taken them to, to Turkey? No, uh, they, at the beginning of the revolution, we have the officer Hassan Hermush, who was the first one who defected from the uh, Syrian army and he went to, to Turkey and then suddenly uh, he was arrested by the Syrian regime. Um, and uh, uh, like lately, we, we found his uh, photos with the uh, uh, Caesar's photos. So, and I, I, I guess, I said, I guess there is no evidence. Uh, I'm sorry that I, I cannot be sure of everything. Yeah. We have a, a question from uh, Alice Hervé. Alice? Yeah. Alice? I just so just on what was just said by Nora, I wondered if these prisoners that were being transferred into Syria were Syrians who had escaped and who were being brought back? Yeah, some of them uh, like were just uh, returned by the government in Lebanon and in Turkey and some of them just went back and almost like hundreds of Syrians who went back actually from Lebanon to Syria got arrested and also uh, literally all the people that give themselves to the government after this settlement in like let's say Daraa, Eastern Ghouta, Homs, they were detained and many many of them were sentenced to death actually. So there is no any kind of like feeling secured with the regime, unfortunately. And we have the la like the recent case about Mazen Hamadeh, who was not stable emotionally and mentally. mentally. And he was, uh, he, he went back to Syria and he was arrested, like he, he has been arrested since February and nobody knows anything about him. We just, we just know that he, he is, uh, is held by the Air Force uh, facility. Thank you. And we got another question from Bruce uh, to follow up on. Bruce, Stanley? This has been wonderful. Thank you very much. And I'm just wondering about prison riots or uprisings and resistance of different kinds within prisons, uh, and particularly how families hear about this and what effect it has on them. And if I could add a sort of supplementary to that, uh, uh, in the sense of the you know, everybody in the region is worried about prisons in terms of the pandemic and to what extent, you know, that has also you know, created massive concern for families, etc., of, of people, of uh, families of detainees. 
Um, actually, our last campaign was about COVID-19 and basically the, the spread of the uh, uh, disease in, um, in detention centers. And we have a lot of uh, examples about, about this in the from the past in many detention centers around the world, actually, especially with the, like, uh, for example, the SIDA uh, virus. Uh, right now, we, we knew that just uh, the civil prisons uh, have like uh, uh, have been uh, sanitized and uh, they like they distribute masks for the prisoners, but it's nothing because our fears is basically about the prisoners inside Naya Jail and in the security facilities. Um, they are uh, we we raised awareness about this. If you can go back to the uh, to our Facebook page. Uh, like no photos on, on Facebook, you can see we have everything in, in Arabic and in English. We we were talking about uh, like how easy uh, to spread the COVID-19 in, in detention centers in, in Syria because the prisoners in Syria are already live in so bad circumstances and they are because of torture, because of treatment, because of like no enough space, no enough conditioning, no enough warming. Uh, so they have this uh, like weakness themselves um, because of like holding a lot of prisoners at small spaces. So the infection is so easy to be uh, transferred from prisoner to another. So we have these fears about, about prisoners actually. It's, maybe it's not only in Syria in all the detention centers in the world. Thank you. We now have a question from uh, Eckhard. Eckhard, um, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, we've talked a lot about the prisoners at the moment. It's really, really important. But one thing I was so aware of when I watched the film was, of course, the absence of the two main protagonists of the film, Spassel and Father Paolo, and how you, Yasmin, so sensitively dealt with the absence by speaking to other people who were near him, his sister, Noura, uh, friends and colleagues. Um, but when we're looking at activism and political campaigns and international um, uh, publicity, like the big double-decker bus going around London, etc., what do you see now and in the future, um, the relationship between the others, the ones who are close to the disappears and who are in Syria and how should we, could we best engage them and what risk are they under because they are still visible? Um, I, I can say a few words. I think this has two sides to it. I mean, as a filmmaker, you're constantly in negotiation with the people in the film to assess risk and see what makes sense because film Ha, potentially has a very big platform. Um, it's out in the world, people can see it. it, it generates media attention. And so I was very careful through the process to discuss with Paolo's family, with Nora, like what's okay to show, what's not okay to show, are you happy with this? Um, you know, and at this point in time, everyone is happy with, with, I suppose, taking the risk that this is in public. At the same time, I think there, the, the risks keep changing, but I think for someone like Nora, who was already quite, um, public um, and quite outspoken um, she she already had a relationship to to the potential of that risk but there's a bigger one as you say so there's people who aren't in my film like Nora's family that she mentioned earlier um, I don't know maybe if Nora would like to add to that but I guess for me as a filmmaker if I if I understood that I had the right conversations with people I was happy to take the risk to put the film out there um, with the consent of people in it Nora I don't know if you'd like to add to that. No, thank you, my dear. Hmm. I have nothing to add. I, I just had a, a question, really, I, I think probably more for Yasmin as a film director. It, it, do you think it's becoming, is it becoming much harder to, to cover Syria now, where you see uh, what I said earlier on, the Syrian regime controlling more areas? Obviously, it's been dangerous for, for a long time, but uh, what do you see the challenges for you as a filmmaker to get these voices out now to tell these stories that are so powerful, like Nora's, like Paolo's? It's really challenging to get films of, of Syria out. I mean, you definitely come across the, the conversation that, oh, we've done Syria, whether it's festivals or programmers or TV channels. 
Um, even though I hope that the story is actually much more universal, it's also quite international. It's not just a Syrian story, actually. Um, not only because people travel, but you know, we're, we're in Syria, we're in a living room in Rome, it's affecting families uh, of all kinds you know, in, around the world. And it's not just the case of Paolo that shows that. Um, but I think it is quite challenging for us. Um, and I think, but I do think we have to keep trying to make films in this way, um, because if we can spark interest through the side <laughs> by making a film, by making something people might want to watch, that we can kind of open up that conversation about the other issues, which is the tension and disappearance. But I hope that we can do it through a film that people would like to engage with, because it's quite hard. And I think, you know, what we could do is to show it in a very personal way, um, because the issues are so big, you know, 100,000, that's like, how do you deal with that, you know, that information, but I hope that by focusing down on the personal opens up that avenue. But it's a challenge, so it's really great that people are interested and will help us spread the word because that's the only way we can do it, is collectively. And Nora, um, Joe's just uh, spread the URL of the, uh, the website for Families for Freedom. Could you just give us a little bit more of a sense of the work that you do for, for the participants so that they get a slightly better idea of you know, what, what the organization, what the campaign does? Yeah, basically Families for Freedom is a movement. It's not an organization. I was mentioning that I'm, I'm co-founder in two things. It's a Families for Freedom movement and No Photos Own organization. So basically I didn't uh, talk about Families for Freedom. I just talked about uh, Families, uh, sorry, No Photos Own. But um, good question and uh, good request actually to, to, uh, to ask me to talk about Families for Freedom. Uh, families of, uh, of, uh, for Freedom is a movement. We, we were five women that is established uh, this movement in Geneva at February 2017 and it was one of the most important things that I did in my entire life. Uh, we are not a political uh, group of women. Uh, it's, we are now 11 uh, women that, uh, that lead this, uh, this movement and we have like networks in many countries like in Turkey, in Lebanon, in, uh, in UK for example and we are working on how more network uh, from Syrian families. So we are advocating for uh, for basically uh, uh, four uh, main uh, issues that the right to know for the families of missing persons and enforced disappeared, stopping torture and ill treatment for all these detainees, and allow the uh, INGOs to to enter detention centers and to watch this closely, having a fair trial and abolishing the counter of terrorism and military field court, which are the exceptional court that control uh, uh, these cases in Syria right now, and then the right of justice and accountability. And is there anything that people, you know, here in Britain and Europe, etc., could do to, to help and support? What would you ask for? Uh, we are trying to reach like more of the public opinion in many different countries so where we we have a lot of like we have a kind of uh, uh, visual in in Geneva when we established the movement we have the freedom bus which is uh, like this a traditional red bus from from UK so we started with this freedom bus in in London and it was amazing actually then we went to Paris uh, Berlin and uh, finally Brussels and uh, maybe after the solving hopefully the, um, the issue of um, COVID-19 we will have to will have the, this freedom bus in many countries and advocate uh, more and more broadly uh, in many countries to, to raise awareness about issues in Syria. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions but we have actually reached our, uh, our final uh, Moments. So I just wondered if Yasmin and Nora had anything else they wish to, to add um, before we reach a conclusion. Yasmin? Um, yeah, just a bit of self-promotion. Please share Excellent. news about the film <laughs> um, and upcoming events. I really hope that people can engage with the film and we can find ways to engage with the issues of detention and disappearance in our weird lockdown kind of lifestyle these days. Um, I think we still need to keep fighting this cause. So please tell people to check out the film, to join in conversations and more, hopefully. And also obviously to support No Photo Zone um, and Families for Freedom and watch out for their work as well. 
Absolutely. Well, we certainly try to do that at Carbu. And Nora, any final, final words? I just want uh, to thank everyone and uh, to say again what Yasmin have said, that uh, please share the film as much as you can and uh, support No Photos or Not, Families for Freedom. Thank you, everyone. Well, it just thank remains so me, for me to... Uh, to thank you uh, to, for, for making the film, Yasmin, for Nora to being so inspiring and courageous and everything that you do in the work there. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. And I'll echo what you uh, have just said. Uh, please, everyone, uh, you know, download the film, watch it, share it, and uh, you know, help spread the word. Um, unfortunately, this is not an issue that is, is gonna go away. It'll one, Probably, I'm sure, yeah. will. Uh, return to it at, at Kabu, a, a very painful and uh, uh, harrowing one. But, um, you know, having uh, such a wonderful film, such wonderful advocates as yourself is, uh, you know, helps us to get the message out there. And hopefully uh, one day there will be some form of justice at the end of all of this. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, we, uh, we shall be returning. We have a, another uh, webinar coming up in August, there may be others uh, before that, do please join and do uh, encourage you if you have not to join Carbu as well, a little plug for us as well. Um, uh, we have uh, membership details on our website. Uh, we'd love to have you on board and, or if you would like to contribute in some sort of donation, that would be wonderful. Uh, everybody, uh, otherwise, if you're all going away on holidays and everything, have a lovely holiday, have a great summer and look forward to seeing you at one of these meetings soon. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.